welcome to all of you who are joining us at the Tuxedo Park Library Author Circle on Zoom. Now this would have been our 10th Author Circle dinner and we had planned to go all out, honoring our hometown author, being interviewed by a celebrity New York Times journalist at an ever more gorgeous venue. But here we are, hunkered down at home and doing our best to share with you the excitement over Amra's recently published book. Now, some of you have ordered a delicious dinner for tonight prepared by Tuxedo Park Events, and you'll be dining with us in spirit at home. And I want to thank you all for participating in your support of the library. Hopefully next year, we'll be together for the best ever over the top in the flesh celebration. This evening, we're fortunate to have two shining stars from the Tuxedo Park universe to inform and entertain us. Katie Rossman, writer of <clears throat> feature stories for the New York Times, an engaging interviewer of many authors and celebrities, and this year's Author Circle honoree, Amra Shabich El Reyes. Dr. El Reyes is an associate professor at Columbia Teachers College, author of scholarly articles on education and its impact on societies around the world and very importantly, the chair of the Friends of the Tuxedo Park Library. Mm -hmm. Her book, which was just published a few weeks ago, has received six starred reviews. These are reserved for books of exceptional merit and it's unprecedented in publishing for any genre, much less one position to young adults. Although I'm sure you'll agree, this is clearly relevant to and admired by adults as well. On a high level, the themes in Amr's book touch on resilience, education, hatred, and survival. But knowing Amra, reading this book felt very personal. And I'd like to share with you part of a note I sent to her when I finished reading it, many Kleenexes later, I should add. Amra, the hardships you and your family endured are simply beyond our ability to imagine. Most of us lead such privileged lives in this country. And even with good intentions and the now common video footage of war scenes, racist attacks and refugee camps, we cannot fathom the life of such oppression or the deep scars that haunt survivors. Your notes at the end of the book make reference to the rise of hatred and intolerance that plague our society today as blatant warning signs of insidious progression that can overtake us. I hope this will resonate with your young readers in particular, motivate them to understand the parallels and be diligent in preventing such prejudices and inhumanity to flourish. But for me, the most moving part of this narrative is the portrayal of your family, their strength and the power of your love for each other. Your story and indeed your life itself are the most beautiful tributes to your mama, Tata, and Dino. Thank you for having the courage to relive those years and share these harrowing experiences so that others can learn. Now, before turning to the program, I'd like you to take notice of the white armbands that Katie Amr and I are wearing, and I suspect you'll be hearing about their significance later. So now turning to the program, Amra and Katie will be in conversation for about an hour, and then we've allotted additional time for questions. So if you have questions at any time during the program, just click on the Q&A at the bottom, right bottom of your screen and type it in, and Katie and Amra will be able to see them at the end. As a follow-up, uh, Diane Loomis, our exceptional library director, We'll be sending you information if you would like to order books, or you can just go to the library website, click on shop. That's if you haven't already purchased them, or if you want to stock up on holiday gifts. And always the library appreciates your support. Should you be moved to donate, please go to our website, click on friends, and then the donate button. Uh, just a reminder, as a special treat for those of you who are dining with us, uh, Diane has sent an email that has a link to Amra's Bosnian music playlist on Spotify. 
So you can play that while you're having dinner. And now I turn it over to Katie and Amra. Uh, Kate, I'm sorry, Amra is going to first read a short passage from her book, and then the two will engage in conversation. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Katie, for being willing to have a conversation with me um, today. Uh, I am deeply grateful for this evening. I know this is not how we had hoped to get together this year, uh, but I do feel that we're still a family. Now we may be a Zoom family, um, and uh, I look forward to your questions and genuine conversation on not only my book, but issues that we are facing in this country that relate to the kinds of hatred and discrimination that I had survived. And tonight I am going to um, read for you a section, a brief section from my book um, that depicts a moment when I first encounter bombs. So this is June 12th, 1992. The war has started or is starting uh, and it becomes real for me that day. Then one bomb falls so close, it seems like it's on top of our heads and the whole house shakes. I feel the feather touch of dust falling from the ceiling. My very bones seem to shake. Everyone jolts awake, calling for their loved ones, screaming, crying, crawling for the lights, but the electricity is out. And we're trapped in the dark. My eyes are wide, staring at nothing. I'm certain the world is ending. It doesn't end. Not for us anyway, not that morning. The bombing doesn't stop for hours. We are rattled and shaken, but, the, but that bomb that woke us all is the closest hit. I can still hear them, though, every one. Some bombs are distant, muffled, like the footsteps of someone in the night. The closest are like stampeding elephants, like fright trains. Sometimes there is a lull, and we begin to hope it might be over. They've made their point, Tata says. The world is watching, and now the world will stop it. But the bombing continues until noon. Someone has lit candles, and we count the minutes by the loudly ticking clock. By three in the afternoon, it seems like the bombing must be over. Tata and an uncle go upstairs. When they come back, they report that our greatest fear is unrealized. There are no Serb soldiers in the street. Surely that means the United Nations has made them see reason, Tata assures us. We will negotiate. We will rebuild. We will bury the dead, I think. One of the neighbors staying with us bursts into tears when Tata tells her the blast that woke us destroyed her house. But your family is safe, Mama chides her. Things can be replaced, people can't. For a long time, the children remain still with fear. The hours of bombing have subdued us, but we've been locked up for three days. And after a while, even our fear can't keep us still and quiet. We start to beg to be allowed outside, upstairs at least, anything, just to see the sun after our long confinement. I can tell Tata wants Dino and me to stay below, but then he's swept up in the work of checking on neighbors, clearing rubble, marshalling supplies, putting out fires. We are on our own. We don't get official permission, but when Tata and Mama aren't paying attention, Dino and I slip outside. We set off hand in hand. I clench him tightly. Sure, something awful will happen, but soon he breaks free and is skipping through the debris like it's a holiday. He was afraid during the explosions, but he seems like he's already over it. Is he that brave or only that young? He's fascinated by the cross section of the house that was hit. With half of the walls sheared off, the private becomes public. A toilet perches at the edge of a rug precipice in the bisected bathroom, staring at the street. Dino dodges playfully around glass, peers into a crater in the street. I realize that I didn't wear my volleyball shoes. It doesn't matter. After seeing the devastation, I think this is too much for one girl to outrun. 
no matter what shoes she's wearing. Because it's all luck, isn't it? Good luck for one, bad luck for another. Why was Vesna's house spared while their neighbors was peeled open like a sardine can? I see smoke rising in the parts of the city, and I imagine people creeping out of their houses thinking, how lucky I was. Now, watching Dino cavort through the ruined street, I have a sudden reckless feeling. We could all die at any moment. I've been an obedient girl, a good student all my life. But this danger would be no different if I were bad. Suddenly, I want to do something bad for once in my life. We're passing the house of Kudic, an old architect with a pretentious French barrette and opinions on everything. The yard is filled with fruit trees and bordered by a limestone wall. The neighborhood kids love to climb the wall, reach over, and steal a piece of his fruit. Most of the time, it's hard and unripe apples and plums, so bitter and nasty, they call it driskulje, or diarrhea fruit. The kids don't care. The fun is in being yelled at and chased by Kudic. Of course, a goody goody like me has never done it. But now, what do I have to lose? I climb the wall, snatch a rock hard green apple and take a bitter bite of the criminal life. Then I can pretend it's the driskulje that makes my stomach queasy as we round the corner to our home street. I exhale a deep sigh. Our street is untouched. To look at our house, you would think there had been no bombs this morning. There are kids on the street even. I see four girls, all close to my age. One of them, Maida, I grew up with. Her father is a music teacher in mama's school. Come walk with us, Maida calls out. I have to look for my cat, I call back. But Dino, who I think has a crush on one of the girls, runs to join them. Be careful, I shout. Though how on earth can he be careful of something dropping from the sky? Then finally, I can do what I've longed to do for three days. I look for Matsi. I call her name, search all around the garden, peer into the canopy of every tree. She's not there. As a last resort, I go inside to look though I don't know how she'd gotten inside. Maybe I left the window open. It's, it is strange being back in my house, even though only three days have passed. It seems so much longer a lifetime ago. There's still a coffee cup on the table, the remnants dried to black sludge. My cousin Jana's grandmother used to read our fortunes in the coffee grounds. She gave Jana many loves, but me just one. The coffee grounds showed long life for all of us. I peer into Mama's coffee cup, but have no idea what fate her coffee grounds foretell. I can hear my own breathing echoing in the empty room. The house feels hollow. Matsi, I call, but of course there's no answer. Maybe she's in my room, her favorite place. I run upstairs, but there is no sign of her, crushed. I walk out onto my balcony and look down the block where I can just make out several tiny figures at the end of the street. Dino with the four girls. Then an explosion. So much louder than what I heard from the basement, this bomb is like a dragon. I see its fiery breath through the window as it explodes at the end of the street. When the smoke clears, there is only fire and wreckage in the place Dino and the girls were walking. Thank you. Thank you, Amra. And welcome everybody to what I think you can already tell is gonna be a very powerful and very important conversation um, about Amra's life, about her book and the context in which we're lucky enough to read it right now. Um, so Amra, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I want to start with, um, you know, why now? 
you've been you've been here it'll be 25 years in January if I remember correctly from the book and um, why why is this the moment that you decided to write your story and share it publicly that's an excellent question um, there was a specific moment a couple of years ago when Dina who many of you know uh, was in third grade um, she is uh, she's a child who loves seahorses and science, um, but she came home one day and she asked me, Mom, what will happen to you and Dad? Uh, what will happen to me and John if you and Dad are rounded up as immigrants and Muslims? Will we be left alone? And that was the question that scared me, that terrified me, that jolted me, that made me realize that my own child was going through the very same emotions and feelings and thoughts that I had before the war started in Bosnia. Um, and at that time I was, um, and I still am, a Columbia University professor who was traveling around the world trying to fix problems in other countries. And I realized that I had a story to tell that could serve an educational purpose here in the United States given what we were witnessing then and what we're experiencing now. What do, what do your daughters think of the book? Um, that's an interesting question because through the entire process, I um, asked them to read chapters. In particular, Dina, um, who very much cares about social justice issues, uh, was focused on reading each chapter and she's watching this right now. And she was, um, uh, she was one person who was giving me consistently amazing and genuine feedback because she heard all these stories. I'll tell you in one detail, when Dina started school at um, Tuxedo Park School and um, two years into it, maybe they were in kindergarten class and um, Dina started talking about genocide. And someone in the class turned to her and said, Dina, what is genocide? And they said, how come you don't know? <laughs> and um, so my kids have lived with these stories um, all their lives. And for them, this is just me now being at the point where I'm ready in some ways um, to share it with the world because I was compelled with, um, with her, their concerns for what may happen to our family and others who may feel other than discriminated and excluded um, in the mainstream narrative in America today. So what would, tell us a bit about what your process was like, separate, you know, from having, um, you know, Dina read in, in chapters or piecemeal give feedback, you know, how did you, you know, we all have our, our stories, some more harrowing than others, clearly, but how do you go from them being the family stories that you share to putting together a book that, it has narrative structure to it that, um, you know, is, has a lot of details and attention to historical details. How'd you do it? Um, for me, it, it, the story has always been there because it's, it's my life um, and the details were there. So in terms of um, blood on the pavement, a Serb soldier who attempted to rape me and that scene um, attacked me, um, as my mom and I were trying to buy food from them um, to survive. All those details um, remain vivid in my memory. They're there. And sometimes it just takes a song or scent to evoke um, those memories to come back uh, rushing. But in terms of the writing process itself, um, I was afraid of the process. I was afraid of going back into that emotional whirlpool because I knew I had to stay there for a long time. Um, trauma is not something that I don't believe can be ever cured, particularly when it's as intense um, as my experience was. But I think those of us who survive uh, wars and genocides and persecutions, we learn to live with that trauma. And that is where one's resilience um, comes in. Um, but I try to push it back in my daily life. And that was not something that I could do when I started writing. And as my husband knows, and, and Dina and Jana and my mom know, I often had migraines and, and headaches by the end of writing certain chapters because I 
had to travel back um, into those um, intense uh, moments. Um, at the same time, I would say that this process has done something remarkable for me on a personal level. And that is that I, once, uh, once sort of those creative energies were in, unleashed, I realized that I needed to write more. And as uh, uh, my book agent, Rob, uh, who is, uh, who everyone will know, Rob McKilkin, knows I had written probably twice as much material than what is in this book because it was also healing um, for me to put my story down on the paper. And one primary reason for that is that I was born hated in former Yugoslavia. I was discriminated all my life and some of those scenes of being discriminated in the educational system in the chapters that precede the the beginning of the war um, are described and um, it was not easy to grow up knowing that I am, um, I don't have a sense of belonging in my own country. And um, for the first time with this book, I own my voice and I own my story and I get to tell that story. No one gets to tell a story of me as a Muslim who represent ethnic impurity um, in white Christian Europe, which is the narrative that Serbia and the Serb military pushed forward that led ultimately to the genocide. And so uh, this story um, reminded me who I was. It also reminded me who I never want to be again, and that is a voiceless, silent Muslim girl. Wow. Well, you are not voiceless. Um, as as we know, and and everyone who reads it will will come to know. So, um, how have your relatives reacted to this? This is you're telling you're telling your story, but you know, you're it's not just your story. And I'm curious how um, how they've taken it and how you interacted with them in the process of it all. There's an entire range of reactions. And I think one reaction that I um, would um, love to focus on, because I do think it um, has an educational component in it, um, is the fact that uh, sexual violence against women um, as, as the war began and genocide unfolded was one of the primary tools of sort of killing the sense of belonging and sense of self-respect for Bosnian Muslims as an ethnic group during the war. And, and thousands of women were raped and the exact numbers will never be known. And thousands of women um, uh, disappeared or were killed um, in concentration camps and rape camps. Um, I do um, talk about sexual violence. Um, I do talk about a specific scene when a Serb soldier attacked me. Um, uh, but there are also much worse experiences that I could have talked about um, that um, are part of history um, in my uh, expanded, uh, extended family. Uh, but the conversation that ensued was whether um, it would hurt those who were repeatedly raped um, to, to have that experience in detail memorialized. And there's also a sense of shame uh, for women who are raped that somehow it is their shame or their, their fault um, to carry. And um, what I think is unfortunate that the, the choice I had to make uh, was whether I wanted to protect the privacy of those uh, family members and, and, and friends um, whose stories um, I know and whose stories affected their lives. Um, or expose the severity of and the kind of brutal violence that women experience in the in the war. And I chose to protect uh, my family members, but um, that just gives you a sense of the kinds of conversations that this book uh, led to in in terms of our family members and simply decisions that were made collectively. What I should and should not share. And, and then you also probably had to take into account your audience. So you wrote this as a YA book, which, you know, I'm sure regular readers know YA is a really robust and amazing, um, uh, you know, area of publishing. And there are many adults who read, you know, a lot of YA books, but the signaling of YA that is that it's appropriate for teens also. And were you, 
was was that in your mind at all? You know, is there too much to share? Um, you know, what will a teenager be able to handle? Or what was your thought process with regard to the audience and your selection as, of YA as the genre? Mm -hmm. Um, on one hand, I wanted to make sure that I am genuine in this book. In other words, that I don't change the experience just to make it less horrific and, and more acceptable to, to the audience. And that was important. And I think I retained that level of honesty in, in this book. And I think all the reviews and reactions more broadly reflect that. Mm -hmm. But um, I would also say that often teens don't have a choice whether they are going to be discriminated against, bullied um, um, in any shape or form. And so I had that awareness that there is sort of reality that we're dealing with that we have to face, whether we like that reality or not. Um, and um, in terms of um, the YA, um, um, generally YA market, it, I do have to say it was important to me to make sure that the gatekeepers in schools um, take this book and, and bring it into the classrooms. And one of the um, sort of happiest moments that I have when I hear um, of reactions to my book is when I hear from teachers who are asking me to um, come into their libraries or into, into their classrooms. And I am doing that. For instance, next Wednesday, I am going um, to um, give a lecture in a classroom of eight graders in a school that um, is largely composed of immigrant children, children who are disadvantaged, who ordinarily wouldn't have an author come and visit their school. And so I will be doing that on Wednesday morning and their teacher is incredibly elated and we have arranged for uh, Open Book Foundation to actually purchase those books uh, for them. So that kind of reception that I'm getting from young adults is important to me. Um, at the same time, I would say that um, I have received reactions that are surprising in some ways. So as an example, a, a former pilot, retired pilot who, was, um, who served in NATO, who is an American soldier, um, retired and, and picked up my book and read it because he was deployed in Bosnia and wrote me this incredibly emotional letter um, saying that he connected um, to my story and the book in ways that he didn't expect and that he cried through much of it. Um, or when I get emails from parents who say, oh, my child said she, she or he would like to read this story and I picked it, picked it up and wanted to check out first few pages and it's 3 a.m. and I read the whole book and I felt compelled to write to you. So um, reactions were, have been um, really emotional to the book and I'm deeply grateful um, uh, for them. As, have all the reactions been positive or, you know, I mean, in, in this climate that we are in in America, have you tapped into that at all? Um, I, I have received reactions that I um, was prepared for. I um, didn't expect them to be as offensive um, as they have been. I've learned some of the sort of curse words um, in English and other languages that I never knew existed. Um, and they've come from people who have far right views in, and sort of as, aspire to be or are white supremacists and um, or Serb nationalists uh, who deny my story, deny my existence, deny the fact that I am who I am and that I had survived what I had survived. And um, that, is, that has been difficult. It's always difficult anytime someone is verbally attacked simply for being who they are, simply for say, telling their story um, is not easy. But I have to say that um, even a couple of years ago before I had written a bo uh, this book, um, I received a threat at Columbia University from an alum who um, is a graduate of Columbia University who read a piece about my work and realized that I was a Muslim um, and Bosnian genocide survivor and who sent me a threatening email and NYPD was involved in um, safety, not just to my own safety, but of my students was in question. And so those kinds of experiences are reality for someone who um, is often viscerally hated simply for, uh, for being Muslim. 
Well, um, you know, you know that back in March, um, I reached out to you when I was being sent to Seattle to cover, help cover the initial outbreak of the coronavirus there. And I asked you if you could help me get in touch in Seattle with um, anybody who had survived the war in Bosnia as you had, and, and you helped me connect to really um, amazing woman who I wrote about in the story. And she talked about, and part of the reason I was interested in finding such a person, and I was trying to think of, of, of people who have gone through a situation where there was no um, sort of certainty of how it was going to turn out. We're just not used to that in America at all. And I wanted to talk to her about resilience, I guess, or, or just her impression. And, and, and she did. She talked about how Americans think that freedom and opportunity is just a, a right and an entitlement and that people who have come from other parts of the world recognize that there are no guarantees. And I'm curious, in this moment, not, not politically for this question, but in this moment in terms of our country still being in the grips of, um, you know, a health pandemic without a vaccine and an economic crisis that is hitting the, the people who um, are least situated um, for such a downturn. And are there, has it resonated with you um, in terms of what you came, came through and overcame? Is it, what does it bring up for you? Um, there, there's so many thoughts that I have in response to that question, but um, I'll start with this. And, and, and it really comes from the reactions to the book uh, from those who have read it. Um, and people who have said, I sort of forgot that I'm reading about a Muslim girl surviving genocide because the sense of social unrest and, and upheaval and uncertainty and fear and discrimination and othering and this narrative of us and them um, is so relatable um, that people are going through their own emotional processing of what is happening in the United States uh, right now. And I think that, that in many ways, the cat I never named serves as a reminder um, to Americans who have read it and who I hope will continue to read it, that hatred is not exclusive to any one group of people, any one nation, any one person. We're all capable of it, uh, of that emotion. And in, in, in a lot of ways, hatred can be stronger than love. And I say that uh, because I had an uncle who was a an officer uh, and retired as an officer in the Serbia's military who knew what Serbia's army was going to do to us. And I, um, I mentioned him, I don't go into some of the details of the knowledge of the conflict that he had in the book itself, but when someone who is that close to you as a family member can actually be blinded by hate and dehumanize you, um, it is, it, we enter a dangerous space and a dangerous time. And I do feel that America is in that place right now. Um, we can't have, in some cases, conversations of the family at the dinner table. And my concern is, and my warning with this book is that we may be at the point where there is no dinner table to share. And that is not what I want to see. I had experienced it once. And for anyone who says it will never happen here, when they read the initial chapters of the book, they'll see that I had that very same sentiment. I was just a happy teen who loved volleyball, math, and, and, and physics, and enjoyed writing. And I couldn't have imagined that uh, even family members of mine would be engaged in the execution of my entire ethnic group. So let's talk a bit about Matsi the cat, um, who gets, you know, good billing right in the title of the book. Um, and Matsi the cat is 
a character, is a metaphor, is a motif. And, and I do really urge everybody to read the book. I'm trying not, I'm trying to avoid spoilers, you know. Um, but, but, but tell us a bit about Matsi and, and what you understood about Matsi at the, in real time and when you came to see, you know, more profound understanding of the role that Matsi played in your life? Um, Matsi was a cat that came into my city with refugees that were coming in, sort of flowing in, um, in days um, just before my city was besieged by the Serb army. And I encounter Matsi, um, and Matsi refuses to leave me and my family. She sort of adopts herself. And uh, I'm very honest in the book uh, with the fact that we didn't want Matsi. My mom didn't want hair on the furniture. My parents felt we could barely feed ourselves. The war is about to start. How are we going to take care of another living being? Um, and I personally was afraid of anything with claws. Um, I was attacked by a German shepherd when I was little. And so none of us really wanted her. We wanted to reject her um, in many ways. And she didn't care. And um, in fact, the, the section from the book that I had uh, read tonight illustrates to you that, uh, and this will be a, a bit of a spoiler, that uh, my brother survives. And um, obviously I survived. Uh, that moment of the explosion, largely because we were looking for Matsi. That was not the same fate that four of our friends um, um, experienced. They were blown up to pieces. And so on the very first day of the war, my story would have ended. There would be no story to tell. There would be no life to live um, if it were not for Matsi. And Matsi continues to do that for us through, throughout the entire war. And in many ways, it was only when I started to write the book and realized that in my stories, she was coming, um, coming up repeatedly because she was so essential to our physical, emotional, and, and social survival. And keep in mind, we had no Zoom, we had no internet, we had no electricity, we had no access to the outside world. Um, um, and she was the only entertainment and sort of happy life that we had in our household, aside from us as family members. Um, so she became this parallel of how I felt when I came to the United States. And some of you have heard this story, but the moment that defined my feelings about America was when I stood in the immigration line and um, felt like a broken, young woman. I was 20 when the war ended. Um, I was 16 when the war started. So the most beautiful years of my life were gone. People I loved were stolen from me. I had few dollars in my pocket. I was only armed with fear and broken English. I was terrified of men in uniforms. I thought they meant killing or rape. And so when it was my turn to speak to the immigration officer, I was so weak and so scared that I held onto his counter, shaking and sweating. And after a long time of going through my paperwork, he handed it back to me and, and touched the fingertips of my hand and said, ma'am, welcome to the United States of America. I'm sorry for what happened to you. You're safe now. And that moment of acceptance, that moment of humanity and connection I experienced is the moment I fell in love with America. And my book is in many ways a love letter to the United States of America, to that dream of being part of a society and being taken in. And I realized that in many ways I parallel Mati's experience. We didn't want her, yet Mati became so fundam fundamental to our survival, and I wanted to thank her um, in many ways by giving her uh, presence in the title of the book. Makes me cry. It's really, it's really um, beautiful. And I had actually, um, you know, written written that line down um, where you had said. Um, all I can do in response is sob. He has paralyzed me with his humanity. This, I think, is what America is. And I wanted to know if, if you know, we can still lay, lay claim to that. Is America still 
that moment and that place and that touch and that, you know, word of you're welcome here and you're safe. Do we still have that here? I'm an optimist. Look, I, I, I could not be anything else but an optimist given what I had survived and given where I am now. I'm, I wake up every morning thinking, is this my life? Is this real? Uh, or will I wake up somewhere else in a different um, lifetime? So I'm a believer in the goodness of people. I um, also come from a perspective that education is incredibly important. Um, and uh, really, I became educator uh, the very first time during the war. I was a kid, uh, a teen, but many of my teachers at the time were killed um, or injured. My mom was deaf and I depict that moment as well when our house was bombed. Um, and I was asked to teach. Um, and I remember um, hopeless children in fifth grade who um, I met the very first time I walked into the classroom. And we decided instead of crying and sobbing together that we would fantasize and, and dream together. Um, and some of those kids have reached out to me now. One of them is actually an engineer here in the United States. Um, and he said to me, the, the stories I shared or the things that I taught them in those days is what gave him his resilience. And in many ways, I, um, I looked at him and, and responded to him and said that, he helped me survive. So I do think we need to turn to each other. And this pandemic is, is sort of um, underlining that human contact need that we all have and compassion and collective empathy. And for that, we need storytelling, which is largely why I wrote the story so that people can actually identify uh, with someone who has a very different story and very different background than they do, but they can see uh, where we share um, emotions and where we share loss and love and, and that we are one people. And I think we can become that. The problem that we do have, however, is the narrative um, that is not inclusive, that is not um, um, respectful of diversity in this country. And I think that is where the damage is coming. But I do believe we can repair that through storytelling and through education. Um, so, uh, I want to stick with education for a second because there, I mean, there are, it's touched on throughout the book, but there is a moment in the book where you go to school and you notice that there are a lot of your fellow students who are not in school and you're walking, the streets are quiet, you're trying to piece it all together and you get into class and, and what you learn from your teacher um, is that everybody but the Muslims have been made aware that the city is going to be invaded so that everybody else could escape um, to safety elsewhere. And, um, you know, but for you and, and uh, your fellow Muslims, you're there and, and the teacher is devastated by this. He's married to a Muslim woman himself is not, if, if I remember correctly. And, and he grapples, you know, with this moment and what it means in the classroom, what it means about, about the, the country at large. And, um, and, and it just so powerful to me. And certainly at this time where teachers are doing so much to, um, I mean, they're, they're facing a public health crisis in order to educate. And I'm just wondering, you know, we get your sense of that experience as, as a young girl and as a student in that classroom, as you wrote it and as you think about it now, how do you feel about that as a mother and an educator yourself? Um, I about that specific yeah, like just as that moment you sort of get it do you just get a, a, a sense of what that teacher was carrying the importance of that and just there's certain things that i um you know have written about um from when i was younger that now that i'm a mother and i sort of relive them in my head they they just are even more powerful and i understand them in different ways mm -hmm. um 
thinking back, I, uh, I'll share a conversation I had with my brother that I think will, will, will take us there to your question. A um, couple of days ago, my brother called me and he said, um, Dino, he said, Amra, you know, I never realized um, you talk a lot in your interviews about this idea that you never read a story and you never solved a math problem with the Muslim girl or boy or, or any person's name in it. Um, and I never realized that growing up as a kid, I never realized that our educational system actually erased us from the stories, from any kind of in form of representation. Um, we, but we did in sort of subconscious level internalize that exclusion. And so we knew that we were there, but not really that we were invisible in our own educational system. And um, thinking back, I was aware of it uh, back then uh, more than my brother who was younger. And so I think depending on the age of one processes information and the educational experience differently. And I would say in that system in particular, it was important to have a mentor or teacher who would show empathy and compassion and connect to one's lived experience. And that particular um, teacher was served by background. He was one of my favorite teachers. He was a true intellectual. And um, he really in that moment um, woke me up to this idea that I was hated, but that still there was humanity in everybody, even in someone like him who had a different background. Um, so thinking back, it is in some ways more painful than it was then knowing how systematic that exclusion was in my entire um, life. And I do think that kids um, and teenagers are in some ways more resilient and perhaps we're made to be more resilient to be able to weather through those initial experiences. And now I'm gonna link it to um, my own kids' experience and how important it is for them to feel represented and included in their own um, education here in the United States. And uh, for me as an educator in the classroom, I make a conscious effort to make sure that no student ever feels that they're not heard, that their perspective is not represented, even if I disagree with that perspective. And so that is um, sort of a, a uh, that is something that I had observed my entire life, but also a message, I think, to parents and educators and anyone out there who has a child in school today, that it is very important that your child, that um, um, those who are in the educational process now have someone they can connect with beyond the curriculum, beyond the content, someone who is going to see them and accept them as a human being who's going to be um, heard and, and respected as everybody else in the classroom. Um, will you explain to everyone the armbands? So this is, uh, this white armband is actually cut from uh, one of Jana and Dina's old um, undershirts that I used to make them wear when they were kids. Um, uh, this, this was an undershirt bought in Bosnia. Um, and the reason why we're wearing it tonight is to honor those who were not lucky enough to survive. Um, as the war started in Bosnia, because um, uh, Serbs as an ethnic group in former Yugoslavia and then in Serbia really controlled this massive army and Bosnian Muslims had no weapons, we couldn't defend ourselves, um, Serb army really swept through the entire country and ethnically cleansed and persecuted people from about 70 to 80% of the territory in Bosnia and Herzegovina within days or weeks of the war. And during that time, um, they had required, um, demanded that as they entered cities that, uh, not in all cities, in some, some cities um, uh, uh, were more of a, a sort of, unchronicled um, experience in terms of that we don't really know in some villages and places what exactly happened. We're still um, finding mass graves throughout Bosnia. But in um, a number of cities, Muslims were asked uh, or forced to wear white armbands like this. 
And so I suspect that many girls who would have been 16, 17, their parents, their grandparents, would have probably cut a white armband from a Bosnian undershirt. Um, and uh, they were forced to wear them so that they could be easily separated from Serbs um, and executed, uh, sent to concentration camp in the camps. In some uh, cases, young girls and women would be placed into um, sort of makeshift um, concentration rape camps where Serb soldiers could come in and rape them as they um, as they please. And so. This is to honor them because many of them uh, are not here to tell their stories that are more gruesome and more painful than my own story. Wow, it's just amazing. I mean, with all the problems that we think we have, it's just a, such an important perspective. Um, I want to give um, I want to give um, some of the people who have joined us a chance to ask their own questions. So. We have a couple questions in the Q&A box right now and I will turn to them, but I want to encourage anybody in the audience, if you have something you would like me to ask, just chime in. Um, so how, how'd you get to America? Can you, you know, it's an involved story, but can you, can you tell us a bit about how you got here, how it came to pass? Um, obviously, that story is in uh, in the book, so I won't go into all details. But I will say that um, something I realized in in the midst of the war um, that I hope is a useful lesson for everyone who is with us tonight is that sometimes we can't control external forces. So I couldn't stop people from killing me, hating me, and in the same way that we can't stop pandemic or we can't stop. Um, racism and the violence and social unrest that is happening uh, right now. But there's always something that we can do that is internal to us. And um, I decided during the war to better myself. And one way in which I did that was to first started starting to start, I first started to learn English. Um, I took my dad's old dictionary um, from our attic and memorized every word. I couldn't pronounce any of them, but I um, knew how to spell all of them. Um, I decided to win math and physics competitions um, in the country and uh, worked with children to immunize them uh, during the war, um, along with doctors and nurses um, uh, uh, in some of the areas where uh, normal access um, uh, was not easy. And um, as a result, I encountered um, two people who came from the International Rescue Committee, which is a very well-known American NGO that um, um, came into Bosnia and specifically my part of Bosnia, our besieged city, to see what was the state of schools and children. Um, there were two psychologists, Wayne and Drew. I don't know their last names. I've tried for years to find them and I can't locate them. Um, they um, um, uh, met me and asked if I would uh, take them around to show them schools. And they met uh, one of my teachers who essentially said to them, look, we're all going to die here, uh, but please save Amra. And that is exactly what they did. They asked me for my documents. I gave them my original birth certificate, my original school transcript, I really thought it was all worthless. We are all going to die. And America was this dream. I was not even allowed to dream, let alone experience. And um, after uh, a while, um, I heard back. I received a call um, uh, informing me that I had a benefactor in the United States who was going to fund my first scholarship. And of course, in response to that, I hung up the phone. Um, I thought it was a, some crazy prank. Someone was pulling on me that was not real. My parents also, when I told them that um, I got this supposedly scholarship, thought I was crazy um, and um, tried to calm me down. I, it was just surreal. It was not possible to be happening to me. Um, and um, that was really what led to me coming here. But I just want to, again, reiterate that if I didn't sit down to, on my own, uh, self-improve and self-educate during the war, I wouldn't have met 
um, Drew and Wayne, and things would not have in my life played out the, the way they, that they did. And sometimes we don't know what's the purpose of specific content that we may master or learn today. Um, but uh, based on my experience, everything that I have learned along the way has always come in handy. Um, and I'm grateful to Drew and Wayne, even though I, uh, um, I may never find them um, again. And also David Pincus, who was the benefactor that uh, funded my scholarship, who is no longer here. That's amazing. I feel like I have to help you find Wayne and Drew. I feel like it's my new journalistic responsibility. <laughs> I mean, I hope, I hope you can. I would love to find them um, because they changed my life and they don't know it. Well, um, I am sorry like it, to be so weepy as I am during this conversation, but I think it is so profound and, um, you know, important and important to connect to the promise of America and what it is meant for all of, you know, you specifically and for many of us, all of us at some point, our, our ancestors, uh, those of us who uh, our ancestors came by their own free will, of course, which is not everybody, but um, it is it is what makes America a great place. And and um, I really just thank you so much for reminding us of all that. And um, one last thing, at, at the beginning of the book, you have um, a, a teacher who's quite adversarial to you. It's not one of the hero teachers. And um, she says, uh, in a not kind way to you, you just wait and see what the world has in store for you. And um, I just read that and, you know, as somebody who operates with a big chip on my shoulder all the time, I just love what the world has had in store for you and what you have had in store for the world. Um, and as, you know, as, a friend and as a part of your community and as an American, I just thank you for what you've done and what you've shared with us both um, tonight and in this book. So thank you, Amra. It's really amazing. Thank you. Um, thank you, Katie. Now, um, now you're making me cry. <laughs> it's well, it's, it's nice to feel it's it's a feeling of great patriotism and and pride and a sense that uh, we have to continue to do more and do better and i think that is a, a you know a call for all of us to answer and you know it's it's really important that you've tapped into that for us thank you and and as we um you're probably watching the time and and uh, we're at the end but i as we end i will share one detail moment with my father that conversation that we had in the war that I think um, should be the final message that I share with everyone and that is um, that there was um, we were in a situation where Serb army was coming so close to our neighborhood that we could see the hill right across our neighborhood uh, being burned down by them we could see them coming the soldiers coming down and destroying and killing um, everyone and my father turned to me and said, Amra, I may not be able to save you. Uh, we may all be killed and you may be raped. But if you do survive, there's one thing that nobody can ever take away from you. And that is your education. So um, I live by that um, and I hope that everybody else um, takes education, not only formal education in the classroom, uh, but their own self-education to heart, because I do think that education uh, brings us closer together. We learn each other's stories and it evokes empathy um, and empathy builds social cohesion and we desperately need it in this country. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I, I truly hope that you'll read the book. Um, you will be better for having done so. And um, hope you who are having dinner tonight enjoy it. Um, and, you know, we hope that you'll donate to the library. Um, it is a center of 
education. It's a center of empathy for all the reasons that Amra has um, detailed. And uh, it's really the heart and soul of the community for many of us. And thank you for supporting it. Thank you, everybody. Okay, good night. Bye, good night.